This video will be a bit meandering and I know that's not everyone's favourite thing to watch so this is fair warning. What does butterfly mean to you? I asked my sister to draw what jumps to her head by default when I asked her to imagine a butterfly. The picture on the right is a less detailed one that she did before I asked her to draw as much detail as she can think of. Do you feel that you can clearly remember? In, in your head can you picture it so that it looks like a photograph? Do you feel like you can do that or is it more abstract? I don't know. Like, yeah. And sort of like, I know what they look like. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I don't remember what they look like. They have stripes, spots. It's like if I, it's like I see it. But then if I try to focus on the thought, I can't see it anymore. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's the same for me. So... Red. Like you, it feels like a photograph, but you can't look at any bit of the photograph. Yeah. Lines. When I was a small child, I was absolutely obsessed with butterflies. I had all sorts of children's books on butterflies in Britain, and for a while my dad helped me to keep caterpillars in a mesh box he'd made, watch them pupate, and then let them out when they became butterflies. As a result of that, I have some what feel like very deeply embedded memories of what butterflies look like. When I see certain species of butterfly, it just lights something up in me. Not necessarily excitement, but this very deep recognition as if this thing was punched into my brain while it was still developing, which I suppose it was. I have a lot of these kinds of mental templates of butterflies, orange tips, red admirals, tortoise shells, um, what we call cabbage whites, I think they're actually called large whites. Um, but if you ask me what's the main butterfly, what's the default butterfly, I'd say the peacock. I don't know why, but as I was growing up I had this idea that it was in some way the main one. I think I must have just had a book with a peacock butterfly on the front cover and gleaned from that that it must be the main one. Peacocks are kind of medium-sized butterflies, um, and many butterflies in the UK are smaller, and yet if you ask me how big a butterfly is, I'd say maybe about three inches wide. Another person might say about one inch wide. In this sense, if you described every aspect of the word butterfly in my own lect, it would be slightly different in meaning to the next person's word butterfly. In this sense, my linguistic system and this other person's linguistic system are a bit different. We both heard what is clearly the same word being tossed around when we were children, but children learn words by watching how they're used and probabilistically inferring what they must mean. If you have slightly different data as a child, your understanding of the word is going to be slightly different. Me and my sister disagree on the colour of these high-vis jackets. She insists that they're yellow and I insist that they're green. Neither of us is colour blind, but when we were children our brains collected all these different data points of what is described as yellow and what is described as green, and our brains used that to divide up this continuous spectrum into categories. My categories and my sister's categories clearly just don't line up exactly, and this is a case where, you know, one, something falls into one category for her and another category for me. But how are we even making these perceptual semantic judgments? It's almost certainly not as simple as this wavelength equals yellow and this wavelength equals green. First of all, the brain uses all kinds of contextual clues and priors to judge the actual colour of something, taking into account what it knows about the lighting and things like that. So if you saw a plant stem that was just over the line of yellow, you might be more inclined to call it green because of a preconception that plants tend to be green. And aside from um, while I'm editing, um, a good example of this colour thing is I was going to use the example of that dress a few years ago that was either um, blue and black or yellow and white. Um, but in a video the other day I commented that my wall was blue and then I uploaded the video and a load of people said that wall must be white. And I think the reason is because um, you only see the wall um, in very specific lighting. And if you don't know exactly what the lighting is or what it's like outside, then the colour of the wall isn't obvious. Um, Hopefully if I pull that back it's more obvious that it's kind of like light, light blue. So how is all this relevant to the title? Well, if you were to describe someone's own personal linguistic system completely, you'd need to have an accurate model of how their brain decides if something should be called yellow or not. 
Me and my sister's models would clearly put the boundary in a different place. So to describe our systems fully, you'd need to characterise that boundary. Where is the edge of yellow? How will the brain decide what is yellow and what is green? People use tens of thousands of words in their linguistic systems, and some have more abstract meanings than others. I've said before that prepositions, words like to and in and after, often have very abstract meanings that don't really map onto each other very well between languages. The only way to really precisely define the word in is to give a long list of examples of it being used. The exact definitions of prepositions in Old English are hard to work out because they're often used without any obvious pattern, especially in poetry. Possibly the pattern isn't obvious because there isn't enough data, uh, you know, we don't have enough examples of any given preposition being used. It seems like Beowulf mixes dialects a little bit and prepositions can differ between dialects, so that might be a factor as well. The word after very often means what it means to a modern English speaker, like subsequent to. But it can also mean something like among, something like about, um, in the way that you could ask after someone, or to ask about them. Um, along or on, you know, something like arising from. Now you could probably look at all of these uses of after and connect them back to the core meaning logically um, of later than or behind geographically. But the point isn't that the uses of this word are random. It's more that there must have been, to any given Old English speaker, ways of using the word after that seemed appropriate and ways of using it that sounded weird. To give an example from modern English, as an English speaker, it makes sense why a 25-year-old Spanish speaker might say that they have 25 years. I can see how that is a logical extension of the word have. But if a native English speaker said that to me in conversation, I'd have to stop for a second and work out what they meant, because it's so unusual to use that phrasing in English that I'd assume they meant something different. This kind of thing's familiar to anyone who's tried to learn another language to a high level. Working out on a case-by-case -case basis what sentences sound all right to native speakers and what sentences don't. Sometimes it might seem pretty unintuitive that one sentence is fine and another sentence isn't fine, and most native speakers probably won't be able to tell you exactly why one sentence sounds wrong. They just know it does. This differs from speaker to speaker. In English, abbreviating the word have to just v is not part of the linguistic systems of most younger speakers unless it's being used as an auxiliary for a past participle. I've been to the shop. I've got three of them. But older speakers, depending on their dialect, may use it in a wider range of contexts. I've enough money for an apple. I've a blue car at home. Again, this isn't anything revolutionary. This difference in language usage is widely known about and remarked on. But we can go more complicated than that. In regular speech, I often use phrases like, I mean, I feel like, to be fair. And in practice, I use all four of them, I think, as discourse markers, phrases that manage the flow of conversation. To describe someone's whole linguistic system, you need to describe the context where they would use these to start a sentence. Is there a difference in meaning between, I mean, he usually goes, and I feel like he usually goes, I think the only way to find that out would be to do a very extensive statistical analysis of the context in which each one was used. Or, picture this. Imagine I'm able to run two perfect simulations of reality, starting at the exact same point in time. But in one, I say, I mean he usually goes. And in the other, I say, I feel like he usually goes. I try my absolute best to keep the intonation and my facial expression the same both times. Does the person respond differently depending on which one I say? Does one discourse marker convey more uncertainty than the other? Does one of them come across more like I'm giving the person permission to disagree with me? On another interesting note, if I ran this simulation a hundred times saying the exact same thing with the same intonation every time, would the conversation always progress in the same way? Are our linguistic systems deterministic? Will a certain input always produce a certain output? There's no real way of testing this until this simulation technology comes along in about two months. And the reason is because if you said the same thing to someone over and over again, the configuration of their brain would change between each time you said it. And so you'd actually be inputting to a slightly different system each time.
This is probably the most difficult challenge we hit. Your linguistic system is constantly changing, never quite the same as it was, accumulating new words, using old words in new ways, honing the situations in which it's appropriate to use words. Um, if you learn a new bit of terminology in your field, every time you read it in a paper, you're picking up a new data point about where it's appropriate to use it, and also how you should code switch. The connotations of words are different in different contexts. I know my grandfather doesn't seem to mind me swearing, but I use it sparingly around him, and often if I'm trying to add a bit of shock value to a funny anecdote or something. Around my friends it's completely fine in a range of contexts. But this isn't a hard and fast thing. Different combinations of people around me will produce different, unique contexts that will change the balance of probability of me using one word or another. Clearly the upshot of this is that any description of someone's linguistic system is going to be incomplete. And ultimately, it's individual people's linguistic systems that are fundamental to any dialect or language. A dialect or language is kind of an abstraction. It's an abstraction that has real-world impact. People talk about their languages and dialects and form social unity around them. But we should remember their abstract nature. Jeff Lindsay recently introduced me to the term reification, treating something abstract as if it's concrete and realer than it really is. And an example of where people do this is in the blanket application of rules to an entire language or dialect, and the refusal to admit exceptions. I have a friend who pretty much has the same system of pronunciation as I do, except when he's emphasising a word beginning with t or d, he'll sometimes pronounce them dentally, t, d. To say this can't possibly be true because southeastern British English doesn't have dental plosives would be an example of that kind of reification. Assuming total unity in a speech community, and in situations where a written source disagrees with a speaker's actual behaviour, treating the written source as more correct than the speaker. Anyway, I'm veering away from the point. Any description of a language, a dialect, or a speaker's idiolect is incomplete, and we shouldn't be too surprised when sometimes the speaker produces something that isn't rigidly in line with what a description of their dialect might suggest. It's important to bear this in mind. Thank you very much for watching this slightly shorter video and I'll talk to you very soon.